only back in 2019, we had a big discussion among NATO allies whether 5G uh, and also whether uh, the Chinese company Huawei, whether that was only a kind of uh, a commercial economic issue or whether who actually controls 5G networks is, yes, it is an economic uh, and a commercial issue, but it is an economic and commercial issue with huge security uh, consequences. So therefore, we also need to take into account security considerations when we de decide on 5G. So the awareness about these issues have increased enormously in NATO. We need to do more. We need to develop guidelines. Uh, we have some resilience guidelines. We need to improve them. We need to coordinate. We need to share information to ensure that we don't... Uh, uh, see once again what we have now seen with, with Russian uh, gas. Um, then, uh, Salman, um, um, uh, the Netherlands. Um, um, yes, also the, the missile incident in Poland reminds us of the fact that the wars are dangerous. Uh, two people were killed in Poland, and, and in wars, accidents happen. And uh, therefore, it is extremely important that we are. Uh, vigilant, that we monitor very closely, but also that we uh, react in a calm and measured way, but also firm way, as we did after the incident uh, in Poland. Um, the incident is ongoing, so uh, there are no absolute final conclusion, uh, but uh, uh, we have no indication that this was a deliberate attack. We don't have any indication that, uh, that, uh, that this was a Russian missile, and uh, so far, uh, 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 we have <coughs> um, uh, the most likely uh, uh, reason is uh, that uh, it was a, a Ukrainian air defense missile that fell down in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Poland. But let me then add the important thing, and that is that Russia bears the responsibility. Because what we do know with certainty is that this wouldn't have happened hadn't Russia invaded Ukraine and hadn't Russia the same day launched roughly 100 missiles against Ukraine. And of course, Ukraine has the right to defend themselves. So the responsibility for this is Russia's. And, uh, and knowing, also the, 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 in, the, we, we welcome, and, and we welcome also the fact that Poland and, uh, and Ukraine are now working together on the investigation. That's fine. It's important. And we need to find out exactly what happened. But it doesn't change the political reality that it just highlights the importance of Russia ending this war as soon as possible and stop attacking Ukraine with missiles and drones. Thank you. Uh, our next three questioners are Jiri Horak. Of, Czech, of the Czech Republic, Theo Franken from Belgium, and David Johan Vadafull from Germany. Yeri. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, dear Mr. Secretary General, I'm interested uh, in your view of the future of Allied defense spending. Uh, since it will be discussed at the Vilnius Summit next year, I would like to know your prognosis. Uh, are there plans to increase the pledge from 2% of GDP or a rate to make rules as to how the money is spent? Thank you. Thank you. Theo. Thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary General. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a question about uh, Sweden uh, and Finland joining our, our alliance. I think it's very important to, uh, to show a unity that means that we cannot delay uh, their membership. So for uh, my question is, uh, are there extra external diplomatic efforts that are taken to convince Hungary and uh, Turkey to, uh, to, to, uh, to accept and to vote the membership in their parliaments? I understood from my uh, Fidesz uh, colleague yesterday that Hungary will vote the 7th of December, so that's good news. But Turkey, they have, uh, Turkey, they have elections also. So I, I hope it will not take one year to have that vote. Uh, we need to show unity on all the, uh, uh, and show all efforts to get them in because we need Finland and Sweden. It's, it's in their interest, but it's also in our interest of our alliance to get them as soon as possible in our alliance. They're most welcome. Uh, from our point of view, we had voted this in Belgian Parliament within weeks. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Theo. David. Thank you, Chair. Can I use the opportunity to thank you, Mr. Secretary General, for your 
ordinary service in our alliance. Uh, and that you stayed in, in this post, though there were alternatives for you personally. Uh, really, you're the, I, 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 I think you are the, the anchorman of, of our alliance. My, my question is that the uh, Russian attack on Ukraine also learned us a new lesson, that the status of being partner of NATO does not deter a potential aggressor. What does that now mean? for our NATO relationship to other partner states like Georgia. Thank you. Thank you. And again, all of you concise thank you. Mr. Secretary General. First to the Czech Republic and GD about the defense spending. Yes, I believe that defense spending will be an important, uh, very important issue at the Vilnius summit. I cannot uh, tell you exactly what allies will agree when it comes to uh, uh, formulating the, the, the pledge uh, for defense spending for the next decade, also uh, because we finalized now the, the pledge we made in, in 2014 for 2014 to 2024. Uh, but uh, I expect that it will be as an even stronger commitment to increasing defense spending. And, uh, and I expect that in one way or another, uh, um, uh, even though perhaps the 2% will be kept, it will be kept more as a kind of floor than a ceiling for defense uh, uh, spending. Uh, but these are negotiations that will go on, uh, but I'm absolutely confident that uh, the ambitions will be increased uh, in one way or another, uh, uh, because everyone now sees uh, the need for uh, investing more, uh, and we also welcome that allies that have been below 2% now are setting new and more ambitious targets, and more and more allies are investing more, just because the world is more uh, dangerous. Um, then you asked me about how to spend. Yes, I said, well, we have the NATO defense planning process, which, is, which ends up with very specific capability targets for each and every ally. So, uh, so there is a link between uh, the ambition of spending more and the targets we agree uh, for different capabilities that allies need to provide uh, with, uh, with more, more heavy equipment, with more uh, air defense systems, with higher readiness, and many other specific defense uh, capabilities that uh, allies uh, should provide according to the agreed NATO uh, capability targets. Uh, uh, then Belgium and Theo. Uh, <clears throat> uh, also, well, there are, also the, the Swedish uh, uh, Prime Minister went to Ankara. I have been in Istanbul, met with the President Erdogan, and, and of course we have a good uh, conversation with the Indian Alliance uh, on the ratification process. Uh, then let me just remind you of the following, that so far, the accession process for Finland and Sweden has been the quickest ever in NATO's modern history. I mean, we have to understand that it has hardly happened uh, quicker ever, any, any time before. Uh, because um, Finland and Sweden applied in May, and then just a few weeks later in June, all 30 allies agreed to invite them to become members, and a couple of days later, all 30 allies signed the accession protocol, and already 28 out of 30 allies have now ratified. This is very fast, extremely quick, has not happened before in NATO's modern history. So, so, so uh, yes, of course, I would very much like the two remaining allies to ratify, and, uh, and I have expressed that uh, uh, many times, uh, but uh, we have to understand that this is so far very uh, a quick uh, process. Let me also add that Finland and Sweden are in a very different place now than they were before they applied. Uh, because since they applied in May, several NATO allies, including the United Kingdom, United States, uh, and many other European uh, allies, have issued security assurances to Finland and Sweden. NATO has increased its presence, and 28 allies have already ratified, and all allies have signed the accession protocol. So it's absolutely inconceivable that if Finland or Sweden are subject to any kind of coercion or aggression by Russia against their countries, that NATO will not act. So it's not as if nothing has happened. They are extremely close to us. Uh, they have received security assurances. And Finland and Sweden participate in NATO's military and uh, civilian activities in many different ways. So yes, I want the finalization of the accession protocol, but we have already achieved a lot just by what allies have done since uh, they applied. Um, then um, Germany, David, 
you point out a very important point, and that is, of course, that we have a responsibility as allies, uh, of course, to protect uh, uh, each other as NATO allies, but we also have a responsibility to ensure that our close partners, especially those who are most vulnerable for Rus of, uh, Russian coercion and aggression, like Georgia, that already uh, uh, have experienced Russian military aggression back in 2008, that we support them. And I strongly believe that as long as we don't uh, 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 achieve uh, or we are, we are not able to, uh, to, to, to get full membership for these countries, then we should at least provide them with significant support. If there's any lesson from Ukraine, is that we, have support, we should have supported Ukraine even more, even earlier. I would like to praise those allies that actually helped and supported Ukraine since 2014. NATO provided some support, uh, some capacity building, some training, but we could have done more before, before the invasion. And that's exactly the same with Georgia and other countries that are our close partners. But I remember, for instance, uh, I, I went to Yavoriv, which is a training site uh, in West Ukraine, uh, not so far from uh, Lviv. Uh, and there I saw, back in 2015, the United States, Canada, uh, but, also, uh, but also United Kingdom, uh, providing extensive training to Ukrainian forces. And of course, this training has been extremely important now uh, after invasion. So if anything, we need more support for Georgia, more support for, uh, uh, for Moldova, more support for other partners at risk uh, now. That's the lesson learned from Ukraine, and you have to help me because then we need money from your parliaments. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General. Um, our next three uh, questioners are Trond Helalan from Norway, uh, Matej Tonen from Slovenia, and Najal Fridbertson from Iceland. Trond. Thank you, Mr. President. There, uh, Jens. I ask you this uh, question in Brussels three days before Russia's brutal aggression against Ukraine. Now the circumstances have changed. Norway shares a land border and a long maritime border with Russia. And we have long been the NATO's eyes and ears in high north. Now we wholeheartedly welcome our Nordic brothers, Sweden and Finland, into NATO. The accession of Sweden and Finland will be good for the alliance as a whole and for all the Nordics. Now we get a longer border with Russia uh, the, because of Finland's long border. But Norway will still be the only country in the region with a maritime border to Russia in the Barents Sea. At the same time, NATO membership for Sweden and Finland will, might also change how we currently think about supply routes across the Atlantic, defense planning in the Nordic region, and the relationship between the High North and the Baltic Sea. How, in your view, will Sweden and Finland's NATO membership affect NATO's and Norway's role in the High North? Thank you. Thank you, Tron. Matej. Honorable Secretary General, dear Jens, uh, thank you for your extraordinary leadership in this demanding time. It was a privilege to cooperate with you in the last three years. Finland and Sweden are security contributors. It is in our interest that both countries become a full NATO members. Months ago, it seemed that Sweden and Finland won't become NATO members because of blockade. At that time, you stepped in and facilitated the dialogue. Can we expect from the Secretary General to step in the process again and accelerate it if needed. Thank you. Uh, Najal. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, President Connolly and Mr. Secretary General. We are all aware of that the uh, Arctic is becoming increasingly important in its strategic security and economic dimensions. As Russia's invasion of Ukraine ends, a post-Cold War era of low tension and cooperation such events highlight how hard it is for states to monitor their own waters, particularly in the high north. With Finland and Sweden joining, seven out of eight Arctic Council states will be NATO allies, which I believe will directly affect Russia's calculus and possible responses in the region. While our common goal is stability and cooperation in the Arctic, 
we must consider the possibility of Russia deciding to employ a more confrontational force posture in the region as well as in the Baltic. Can you elaborate on that possibility and NATO's role in that region? And finally, it goes without saying that Iceland strongly supports Finland and Sweden's imminent application for membership in NATO. Thank you, General Secretary, for an outstanding job. Thank you, Nigel. Mr. Secretary General. Thank you so much. Uh, I think actually I will uh, answer the question from Iceland and the Norway, from you all and from Trun uh, uh, together, because uh, partly because Iceland and Sweden used to be, no, Iceland and Norway used to be the same country uh, for many hundred years ago, uh, before the Danes uh, come and, uh, came and uh, created some problems there. Um, uh, uh, and, but more importantly, because actually because you asked uh, about the same issue uh, about Finland and Sweden and, and the High North, um, and, uh, and, and fundamentally, Finnish and Swedish membership will strengthen NATO in the High North. There is no doubt, uh, because Finland and Sweden are extremely capable uh, countries. We know that because they have been very close partners uh, with NATO for many many years. They have advanced. Uh, 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 systems. They have. Uh, Finland has a large uh, army. Uh, they have uh, advanced defence industries. They have high-end capabilities. Uh, so, so, and, and they have well organised uh, 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 defence forces and uh, and strong democratic institutions. Uh, so, they have, therefore, they have been our closest partners for many, many years. We have worked together with them. We have trained together with them. So, we know them well. And therefore, it's no doubt that uh, they will uh, strengthen uh, NATO uh, 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 throughout the alliance but, uh, of course, in particular in the north, because of the geographic location in the north. Um, uh, this will also help us uh, to both increase our presence uh, uh, in, um, in, uh, in the Barents Sea, in the, in the high north. Uh, you are right, Trun, uh, that uh, Finland and Sweden, they don't have any coastline uh, to the Barents Sea or the, the North Atlantic, but they have significant air uh, uh, capabilities. Uh, that can help us to uh, patrol and monitor uh, also up in the high uh, north, uh, and of course also have naval capabilities that can uh, be deployed up there. Um, um, and, and, and of course, especially Finland, um, with the long border, uh, also has, has a knowledge uh, about Russia, which is unique. Uh, by, when Finland joins the alliance, NATO's border with Russia will more than double. Uh, so the Finnish border with Russia is longer than the total existing NATO-Russia uh, border. Yeah. So, so all of this uh, will, of course, uh, enhance our ability, both to deal with the challenges in the high north, but also in the Baltic. Because, again, if you just look at the map, we have always been concerned about our ability to reinforce uh, the Baltic. Uh, uh, and we had the Suvalki gap uh, with Finland and Sweden in alliance. Uh, it will uh, uh, change very much the geography. Uh, when it comes to NATO's presence in uh, the Baltic. Uh, so, um, so um, uh, it, uh, it, it, there's no doubt that uh, their membership will be good for NATO allies in many different ways, and therefore welcome them. And uh, Mateus uh, from Slovenia, it's good to see you again. Uh, we met often uh, in the ministerial meetings, but now uh, you asked me about whether I will step in. <laughs> I never stepped out in a way that uh, that I have been uh, working hard for, for, for enlargement of NATO since I arrived. First with uh, North Macedonia, no, sorry, first with Montenegro, uh, then with North Macedonia, and then with Finland and Sweden. I like my family or our family to be bigger, and they, when they are candidates, we, <laughs> we work on that. Um, uh, uh, and, I'm, and I'm glad that first we had two members from uh, uh, the Western Balkans, and now uh, we will have two new members from the uh, North. Uh, all of this is strengthening uh, NATO across the board. Um, uh, then, yeah, so that's in my answer whether we we'll step in. Then, let, but let me add one more thing, and that is that the, and I engage, of course, with Finland, I engage with Sweden, I engage with, with Turkey. Um, uh, but let me remember that, or let me remind you of that, the, the trilateral agreement that was signed here in Madrid in June, that was a trilateral agreement between Turkey, Finland, and Sweden. NATO didn't sign. We were in the room, Osman again, you were there, yeah? Uh, but I didn't sign. I only welcomed the signing of the others. Uh, uh, so, so meaning it's a, it's a trilateral agreement between those three countries. So at the end of the day, it's those three countries that have to ensure the full implementation. Um, uh, but I welcome that Finland and Sweden has delivered. And, and then I just uh, think that the time has come for 
uh, for uh, uh, finalizing the ratification. Uh, then, uh, no, then, that's all three, because I lumped Finland and, uh, sorry, uh, two of them together, uh, Iceland and Norway. And that was important to learn about that Iceland-Norway <laughs> yeah. thing. The Secretary General faces many challenges in this uh, tumultuous world, but uh, he's already handled 15 questions from this body. Um, so thank you for your patience. Uh, we got three more. Ante Bakic from Croatia, Arta Bilali Zandeli from North Macedonia, and Mati Redma from Estonia. Ante. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Secretary-General, Dobardan, and greetings from the Croatian delegation. You know, you know, last month we held the first parliamentary summit of the International Crimea Platform in Zagreb, and which brought together 48 speakers of parliaments and presidents of interparliamentary organizations, like our president from NATO PA, Mr. Connolly, was there. In Zagreb, we proudly demonstrate the support to Ukraine, and I would like to hear your comments and thoughts about how to politically approach another issue that in a way bothers NATO and the EU in the Southeast Europe. It is an issue of uh, somehow, uh, somehow stalled NATO's political outreach in the Western Balkan countries. I mean the political interaction and, and practical cooperation with regard, you mentioned the country Bosnia and Herzegovina, but also in Kosovo. The interaction do exist, but the feeling is that everything that has been done in the past has been overshadowed by the malign foreign influence that keeps these countries blocked in a kind of endless limbo and miles away from the further alignment with our common values and political posture. In terms of Bosnia and Herzegovina and Kosovo, what else beyond being simply vigilant can NATO do in order to counter foreign political goal, goal of undermining those countries and preventing them to become more stable and secure on the path, on the path of the EU and NATO? Thank you. Thank you, Ante. Um, Arta. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Secretary General, before the war, we all thought that Russia has very tight links with China. And now, somehow, China is out of the picture. We, see rec we saw recently some strong cooperation between uh, Russia and Iran. But again, I will repeat, China is out. My question is, where do you see the role of China in the picture? And uh, how do you assess its not active role or position after the war or after the Russian invasion in Ukraine? Thank you. Thank you. And Mati. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, dear Secretary General, my question addressing, again, air defense issue. Today's uh, genocidal war by Russia in Ukraine is a clear testimony that Russia violates all international rules and agreed principles and inhuman and unacceptable attacks on the population and civil infrastructure without any military meaning is today's new reality. I call all NATO members to make greater and faster efforts than today to support the military capability of Ukraine. The future of not only Ukraine depends on it, but the future of all of us. In connection with a new reality presented above, uh, the need to secure also the missile and air defense capability of NATO, especially the territories of its eastern flank, is getting a new and broader meaning today. Also the need for more forced action plan. Could you share your views on this matter? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General. Thank you so much. Uh, first uh, to Ante and, Kos uh, and, and Croatia on the Kosovo and Bosnia. Uh, as, as you know, uh, the, the Western Balkans matters for NATO. We have a long history there. Uh, we helped to end the two uh, uh, brutal uh, wars, uh, first in Bosnia and later on in, the, in Kosovo, Serbia. Uh, and we also helped to, to stabilize uh, North Macedonia uh, uh, yeah, almost 20 years ago. Uh, and we still have a presence. Uh, we have our headquarters in Sarajevo, we have the office in Belgrade, and of course we have the K4 forces in Kosovo, and uh, we also have now several members uh, in, in the region, full-fledged NATO allies. I mentioned uh, North Macedonia and, uh, and, and Montenegro as, uh, as uh, two of our newest uh, uh, members. 
All of this makes uh, the Western Balkans an important region uh, for, uh, for NATO. Uh, on, in Kosovo, while we continue our presence, uh, we, uh, we support uh, by our military presence the EU-led efforts uh, for a, a, a diplomatic solution. Uh, we support uh, the, the belgrade pristina dialogue, the, uh, and I think it demonstrates actually how well NATO and the European Union can work together, uh, complementing each other with the NATO forces supporting the EU diplomatic efforts uh, in, uh, in Kosovo. We also work closely with the EU in Bosnia and, and Herzegovina, and at the Madrid summit we uh, decided to step up uh, political and practical uh, support for our partners in, um, in, uh, in the Western Balkans, including Bosnia and Herzegovina, and to help them to uh, uh, resist uh, malign influence uh, from, from, from Russia. Uh, we uh, are also stepping up our support to Bosnia and uh, Herzegovina in different ways, in or in different ways, in order to uh, to help them, including by uh, more and uh, uh, an enhanced uh, defence capacity uh, building, a new uh, package of def defence capacity building efforts for uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, to help them to implement its plans for moder modernisation. Of, it, uh, of its defense and security institutions. Um, uh, we are working closely uh, to help them. Uh, it's not easy, uh, but we will continue uh, to uh, do what we can uh, to help to address the instability and the challenges and including the malign in influence of especially Russia in the region. Then Arta, North Macedonia, the role of China uh, related to the Ukraine conflict, if I understood the question right, well, uh, first of all, uh, we have called on China, and that was also my message when I met with the Chinese Foreign Minister uh, in, um, in New York during the UN General Assembly, that China should clearly condemn the illegal Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine. They have not voted in favor of the different UN resolutions doing so, uh, but we call on them to do that. And also, of course, we regret uh, that, uh, that just days before the invasion, Russia and China signed the joint declaration of President Putin and, and President Xi signed this joint uh, uh, declaration uh, where they stated that uh, the partnership with Russia and China, between Russia and China, is without limits. Having said that, of course, we also welcome that China, uh, at least uh, so far, has not provided any military support to Ukraine. This is important. No one should support Ukraine. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, Russia, uh, uh, in their efforts to, to occupy uh, Ukraine. No one should provide uh, support to Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine. Uh, and that has also been a clear message uh, from NATO allies to, uh, to uh, China. Then, um, uh, Mati uh, from Estonia on air defences. Well, uh, air defences is extremely important. Uh, but I think sometimes we need to realize that air defenses is partly land-based systems, uh, like the Patriot batteries or the SAMT batteries and these land-based systems, or the NASAMs, which I've seen uh, very effective in, uh, in, uh, in Ukraine. But air defense systems are also very often based on ships, uh, and they are extremely capable and very mobile. And also, of course, uh, planes. Uh, um, our jet fighters are also an important part of our air defense systems, partly with the sensors, but also uh, uh, partly because of their capability to intercept incoming missiles or, or, uh, or uh, uh, um, uh, other types of air uh, attacks. So uh, the fact that we have significantly increased our presence, both on land but also at sea and in the air, uh, in the Baltic region and in the east, and that we can very quickly reinforce if needed. I visited recently uh, the USS uh, um, uh, uh, George H. W. Bush, uh, uh, the, the aircraft carrier. It was based in the Adriatic Sea, but those capabilities on that aircraft carrier, supported by ships from Italy, from, uh, from, from Turkey, from many other NATO allies, they represent a huge uh, uh, capability also when it comes to air defense. So, uh, yes, we need to do more on air defense, but we should not underestimate the capabilities we already have in place and also our ability to reinforce with air and naval uh, assets quickly if uh, needed. Thank you. Doing all right? Yeah. Okay. All right.
So our next three are Zolt Nemeth from Hungary, Anna Maria Katata from Romania, and Raymond Bergmanis from Latvia. Zolt. Thank you very much, President. I am right to you, Secretary General. Uh, right to you. Uh, I would like to greet you in the name of the Hungarian delegation uh, and express our gratitude for your work and for your presence here. Uh, I think you have been instrumental in maintaining the unity of the alliance in the past period, and I would like to congratulate to you on that. Uh, my original question would have related the Western Balkans, but probably you have covered it uh, more or less in the previous round. So uh, I would like to ask you a question which uh, relates the uh, uh, European uh, political community. Uh, on the 6th of October, uh, uh, President Macron uh, has initiated this new format. And uh, in the Council of Europe and in parliamentary level, we are uh, fighting with this uh, challenge. Uh, uh, what is the role of this organization relating to the Council of Europe, relating to NATO? And uh, I think uh, uh, it is just uh, in the formation. And may I ask you if you have any position, uh, personal position, because probably not yet official one, uh, how do you see the relationship between NATO and this new European format, uh, which targets at uh, security aims as well? It seems that uh, the security dimension of this European political community is quite decisive. Thank you, Thank Thank you. you very much. Thank you, Zolt. Anna Maria. Thank you so much, Mr. President, Secretary General. Um, the summit in Madrid marked a very important moment for the alliance in general, but also for the eastern flank. And with the new battle groups that will be uh, in place in, uh, for different European countries on the eastern flank, including Romania, the deterrence and defense of the eastern flank will be more balanced, and we are, um, uh, we are very excited about having them fully operational. But you mentioned earlier the lessons learned from Ukraine, and my question would be in terms of a more multi-domain perspective, what will the Vilnius summit discuss on the defense and defense of the eastern flank, including cyber, including space, and why not including uh, maritime security and the, the free uh, flow of trade? Thank you so much. Thank you. Raymond. Yeah, Mr. Secretary General, I'm not going to repeat what Russia did and continue to do in Ukraine, but my question is about the uh, security of Russia's neighbors, namely the Baltic states. Thinking, uh, taking into consideration that one of the major subjects for our NATO PA, Defense and Security Committee, for next year will be evolving Baltic Sea security. Could you elaborate on that, how the NATO started to work on the new plans for security of the Baltic states and after full accessions of Sweden and Finland about plans for the security of the all Baltic Sea region. We hope and we would like to believe that both our colleagues, Sweden and Finland, will be able to participate in the next NATO summit as full-fledged members. By the way, next summit will be held again in the Baltics, this time in Vilnius. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General. Thank you so much. Uh, first, uh, the question from Salt uh, Hungary uh, on uh, the European uh, political uh, community. Well, as a <clears throat> NATO allies and, and also non allies uh, that were present there, uh, of course, they, 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 they meet in different uh, formats and in different uh, organizations and institutions. And I think, in general, it's good that, uh, that, that um, allies uh, and, and uh, close partners in Europe meet in uh, different uh, uh, ways. Uh, as long as we all are aware of that the bedrock for our security remains NATO. Because the bedrock for our security is transatlantic. And there's no way that can be replaced. Uh, I, I, as I've said many, many, many times before, I, I welcome uh, European efforts on the fence. And I welcome EU efforts on defence, uh, uh, on uh, on providing more capabilities, uh, PESCO to address the 
fragmentation of the European defence industry uh, or the European Defence Fund and, and, and many other uh, efforts. That's, that's very uh, important and, and, and something I welcome. And of course, any meaningful strengthening of uh, uh, European defences uh, requires more defence spending and NATO has been calling for increased defence spending across Europe for years and now that's happening and that's a good thing. But this can only complement, not uh, replace NATO. Uh, because uh, two world wars and the Cold War thought us that our security is totally dependent on the North Atlantic link, on the North Atlantic bond. Uh, Europe, uh, North America and, uh, and Canada uh, together. So, 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 uh, and I don't, uh, and, and I'm very different. I'm glad also that the message is that this is not a, a, any alternative to NATO. This the aim is to complement uh, and uh, and to strengthen uh, what we do uh, uh, together. Uh, and um, uh, and I think also we have seen that in Ukraine. Of course, the, the reality is that there's a support from the United States and North America to North American countries has been critical for the gains that Ukrainians have made. Uh, and, also the fact, and also the fact that, that is especially Canada and the United States, they have been there since 2014. They have th trained tens of thousands of Ukrainian soldiers. Uh, uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, you have also allies uh, that have supported Ukraine, uh, especially since the invasion, but we need to do, to do this as North America and Europe together. Um, then, um, then on uh, Maria, uh, Romania, uh, well, the multi-domain uh, approach, of course, will be a part of what we uh, 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 address in uh, Vilnius, uh, as it has been actually for a long time. Uh, we have to remember that we are very much aware of that uh, any military conflict in the future involving NATO allies, especially in a large-scale conflict, will be multi-domain. It will not only be land or sea or air. It will be land, sea, air, and cyber, and space. And space and cyber is integrated in everything we do. Our land operations, our uh, 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 operations at sea and in the air are totally dependent on cyber, of course. And cyber and our communications and our targeting and a lot of things that we do on land or on Earth is dependent on, uh, on space capabilities, satellites, GPS, navigation. So, so, so there is no way to not be multi-domain. We have to be multi-domain in everything we do, and that's also reflected in... Uh, our new plans and, and the decisions we have made, both on cyber and space, establish them as a new um, military domains alongside air, air sea, and land. Uh, then, uh, Ramon, great to see you again. Uh, uh, Latvia, always, uh, of course, focused on the Baltic region. It, as, of course, when Finland and Sweden joins, uh, we will also then uh, adjust our defense uh, plans and uh, uh, and, and our defense planning processes to take that in, into account. And without going into details, partly because some of these plans are quite secret, uh, it, it, you know, it's everyone that looks at the map understands that it has a huge impact on our ability to protect and defend uh, the Baltic region. Uh, and, and, and that increases our deterrence. And by doing so, uh, we are further reducing the risk on any attack on any NATO ally. Uh, because the, 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 the purpose of NATO is not to actually, uh, 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 the main purpose of NATO is to preserve peace, is to prevent an attack. And the stronger our deterrence and defense is, uh, the more likely it is, or the less likely it is that there will be any attack. And therefore, I welcome also Finland and Sweden as members because it will strengthen further our deterrence and defense uh, across the lines. Thank you. Um, our, our next three uh, questioners are Risto Gatchev of Bulgaria, Mikhail Sherba of Poland, and Lord Hamilton from the UK. Is that a cheering section for you, Lord Hamilton? Okay, Risto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Secretary General, uh, first of all, I, I would like to say that the newly elected uh, 
Parliament in, in, in Sofia, one of the first uh, decisions that, uh, that we made was to, uh, to make a decision to send direct military support to, to Ukraine. And I think this is important uh, for, for our country to do. I have two quick questions uh, following the time. One, you mentioned a couple of times the air defense. Uh, you mentioned the air defense in the Baltics, but what about the southeastern flank? Should it be reinforced after the incident in Poland uh, last week? And the second uh, question is, what is the possibility of joining the efforts between NATO and the EU uh, on uh, resilient, resilience capacity building uh, between, uh, between the, two, uh, the two organizations? As you mentioned, uh, most of the EU citizens will live in NATO countries after the accession of uh, Finland and Sweden. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mikhail. Mr. Secretary General, General I'm here. Uh, thank you for your strong leadership in these uh, difficult uh, times. Uh, we should be prepared for more hostile actions against Ukraine, but also against NATO states. Russia's aim are to weaken us, diminish our determination to support Ukraine, and we can't fall into Ukraine fatigue mode. Even Today, this morning, our assembly has shown responsible unity and soon will give a strong message of solidarity with Ukraine in our resolution. Russia's actions against Ukraine are escalatory, and last week the massive attack on Ukraine's infrastructure was the largest since the beginning of the war. Recent incident in Polish territory is also a result of this escalation. Ukraine needs more Western advanced precision weapon, and we ask NATO governments for it. Two questions to you, Mr. Secretary General. In reference to escalation, how NATO can strengthen its military presence in the eastern flank? A lot has been done, but we should, what should be the next steps? And the second question, do you agree we need a re to, reflect, to reflect better on threat from the territory of Belarus. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and Lord Hamilton. Secretary General, you've um, emphasized to us how essential it is that the war is won um, in Ukraine um, and, and that the Russians are beaten. This would have happened already if we'd imposed a no-fly zone in uh, Ukraine. People who are worried about a no-fly zone say that we would be inevitably in conflict with the Russians. That is because the air defence systems are the other side of the Russian border. We could create a cordon sanitaire, which meant that we were out of range of air defences um, in, in Russia. Um, and so what is the chance of... What's the military argument for um, imposing a, a no-fly zone? Surely it's quite possible to do this. Thank you. Mr. Secretary-General. Uh, first, uh, Risto from Bulgaria. Um, uh, air defenses um, um, uh, in the Black Sea region. Uh, well, as we have, we have increased our presence also in the Black Sea uh, region. And as I said several times, uh, this includes also air defense capabilities. And, uh, and with, uh, uh, with our air and naval capabilities, it's also easy to quickly reinforce. But let me just add one more thing. And it's not as if NATO has some kind of uh, unlimited access to uh, NATO air defense systems. Of course, what we are dependent on is that allies provide air defense systems and that we pull them together. So, uh, if anything, it just highlights the importance of allies meeting at least the 2% target and also delivering on the NATO capability targets uh, to be able to provide the necessary capabilities uh, to... Uh, uh, increase our air defense uh, um, uh, of NATO territory and our ability to reinforce. Um, so this, this is what we do, uh, and, uh, but uh, we are totally, as always, totally dependent on allies to deliver on, on, on what they have promised. Then you asked about NATO-EU. Um, I think I've already said some, some few words about that, but let me just add that, again, especially with Finland and Sweden inside, uh, 96% uh, of the people living in the EU live in the NATO country. That makes it just even more important that we avoid duplication. Uh, that uh, what the EU does uh, is complementing uh, uh, NATO efforts. And of course, and of course, yeah, also, 
Also, I, I'm, I'm personally a strong supporter of the EU. I've tried to convince the Norwegian people to join uh, uh, EU uh, twice and lost twice. So, uh, so, so, but I am arguing in favor of EU as I believe in the uh, European Union as a concept, as an idea. Uh, but at the same time, we need, just need to realize that, that there are also many... First of all, we have North America, we have Canada and the United States, and they, they're not small nations, they actually contribute to our shared security. But second, we have also some Europeans who are outside the European Union. There, there, is more, there, is more, there is more Europe in NATO than there is Europe in EU. There are 450, you know, there are 450 million Europeans in the EU and that's 600 million Europeans, uh, uh, Europeans in NATO. So, 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 so it's not, we need to ensure that we work together in NATO to address uh, the security needs for all allies, uh, inside or outside the EU. I welcome EU efforts, but it doesn't replace NATO and it must not duplicate NATO. Um, uh, uh, and I said that as a really a strong friend of the EU and also uh, I'm proud that as Secretary General of NATO I have been able to work together with the presidents, the leadership of the European Union and also the different uh, EU members to lift NATO-EU cooperation to unprecedented levels. Uh, 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 then, uh, 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 Mikhail from Poland, uh, you mentioned Ukraine fatigue, and that's extremely important what you said. And that is, we must prevent that from happening. Uh, because uh, we, can, we, can, we cannot allow President Putin to win. And he should never, never believe that democracies are in a way not resilient, not, are not able to sustain an effort over time. And as I said, this is because it will be a catastrophe for Ukraine, but it will also be extremely dangerous for us. Because then, then the lesson learned will be that by using force, he gets exactly what he wants. Uh, so this is also about our security interests. Uh, but to prevent any fatigue, to enable us to continue to support, at the end of the day, there's only one thing that, uh, that depends on, and that is the support from our public. So we need the support, and you are closer to them than anyone else, because you are elected representatives uh, from your different constituencies. So, so I do what I can. I travel around and argue in favor of support to Ukraine. But I, you need, and I know that you do that, but we need your support uh, in the different uh, uh, member states, allies, to ensure that people understand why we need to pay a price to ensure freedom and democracy, and that is in our uh, interest. Uh, then, um, uh, yeah, then, sorry, you asked also what, what, what we will do to further increase. So, first of all, we have doubled the number of battle groups from four to eight. Uh, we did that after uh, the, as we have done that over the last months. Second, uh, what we agreed in Madrid is that we have to be able to scale these battle groups up to brigade, uh, brigade size level. We will start to exercise and test that. And the way we do that is to have earmarked forces. For instance, Germany have now earmarked a brigade that can be uh, deployed uh, to Lithuania on very short notice. They will exercise uh, and so on. So there will be a close link between those so forces and the ability to scale up uh, the brigade or the battle group to a brigade uh, size on very short notice. Second, we are going to pre-position more supplies and more equipment. And again, you see in the war in Ukraine how important supplies ammunition, equipment is. Uh, and thirdly, we will increase the readiness of forces. So where needed, we can deploy forces uh, quickly. And then there are a wide range of other things we will do on, uh, on, uh, on air, uh, um, naval capability, cyber, that also matters for the defense of the eastern part of the uh, alliance. Then uh, Lord Hamilton, also on the no-fly zone. I am aware that this has been an issue. It was raised at the beginning of the war. Um, um, uh, I think that for allies, it is important that we are not party to the conflict. Uh, and if we started to deploy forces uh, into Ukraine, uh, we would uh, become party to the uh, conflict. But allies are uh, very determined uh, to help Ukraine defend their own uh, uh, airspace. Uh, and uh, that's exactly what they have done uh, by providing all the air defense systems, the ammunition to the air, air defense systems. UK have done that, extremely important. Uh, but also, 
uh, but also the fact that uh, they are providing training. Again, UK is leading training efforts. I just visited the United Kingdom, and I met there with uh, uh, British trainers, but also with trainers from Denmark, from, uh, from Lithuania, from Canada, from many other countries that are helping to train Ukrainian soldiers uh, also uh, uh, with air defense capabilities. Uh, in the United Kingdom as a joint effort by many NATO allies, and the and, and United Kingdom has actually provided training to, 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 to Ukraine since 2014, uh, and this makes a huge difference. So we will help them to protect their airspace, uh, and that's the way uh, we will ensure that uh, they are able to shoot down Russian missiles, drones, and, uh, and, and strengthen their control over their own airspace. I thank the Secretary General. I would only note that we had no-fly zones in Iraq, uh, in the north and in the south, and we in fact did engage with and shoot down Iraqi aircraft. Um, and so the risk of engagement when you have to enforce a no-fly zone is very real. Uh, and, and our goal is to constrain and end this war, obviously, not to expand it. Um, our last, if you're willing, our last three questioners are Manousis uh, Volodakis from Greece, Hans Wallmark from Sweden, and Miko Savola from Finland. Manousis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. General Secretary, you said that the uh, accession process of Sweden and Finland uh, has been the quickest yet. Nevertheless, it might be not quick enough because it is the only one that has been going on while war rages on in our backyard. Uh, Finland and Sweden, uh, and moreover, there, there, there are not procedural issues with these. There are political issues, uh, in particular Turkey's objections. Finland and Sweden had to declare the, something that's a self-evident truth to most of us, that they do not nurture terrorism. Five months have passed and we still see no progress. To the citizens of member states, uh, the, the, the question is raised, what is going on? Uh, are there any concerns regarding the ability of Finland and Sweden to counter terrorism? Thank you. Thank you. Hans. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, and thank you that the Secretary General remind of the special relations between Iceland and Norway. Let me remind the Secretary General of the special relations between Sweden and Norway. If the gentleman would suspend, we cannot hear the question because of discussion. If you're going to have discussions, I would respectfully ask you to take them out of the plenary session. The gentleman may resume. Thank you. Well, let me remain, uh, remind uh, the Secretary General of the special relations between Sweden and Norway. We shared the kingdom for 100 years. Uh, and we are very fortunate, fortunate to have very good neighbors, but we also try to be a good neighbor and a good ally, and that is also our intention, together with Finland inside NATO. We see ourselves and Finland as a security provider into NATO, and we also have this broad concept on security. It's on the hard defense, but also on the fight against terrorism, and therefore I hope that in the uh, coming days we can also convince Turkey of this uh, trilateral agreement that we are delivering on it. Uh, and I really want to ensure that Sweden and Finland also taking with us and transmit all the good words, all the friendly cheering uh, and the support for our, our countries into NATO because uh, I think that uh, uh, everything is linked to each other. So the Mediterranean, the Black Sea, the Baltic Sea and High North are linked to, together and therefore we're going to be a provider of security. So in Swedish, tak, in Finnish, kitos. Thank you, Hans. Miko. Thank you, Mr. President. It's easy to continue what, what, what the brother from the Sweden just said. I want to thank you, Mr. Secretary General, for our support in our goal of becoming a member of, of NATO. And I also want to thank you all, wonderful colleagues here, partners and friends, welcoming us to the Alliance. 
almost all of you have ratified our membership uh, in our in, in your parliaments already and you did it very rapidly as the mr general secretary general said uh, this has been the fastest fastest process ever um, maybe one more one, once more uh, one question to mr secretary general um, Finland and, and Sweden wants to be the security pro providers in, in the NATO. Uh, in Finland we have a strong conscription army with over 900,000 reservists and uh, we are spending now that over 2% of the GDP to the defense cost. So, uh, so you partly answered the question already, but how do you see the future role of Finland and Sweden in the NATO defense policy planning? Thank you all uh, wonderful colleagues and Mr. Secretary General. Thank you so much. Mr. Secretary General. Thank you so much. Um, first uh, to uh, Malusis from Greece um, on, uh, on uh, Swedish and Finnish membership. Uh, well, as a, there is a process, there is a dialogue, um, uh, and I'm confident that uh, Finland and Sweden uh, uh, will become, also the, they are already invited, we already signed the accession protocol, but I'm confident that we'll be able to finalize the the accession process uh, uh, within reasonable time. I will not speculate exactly when, but the sooner the uh, uh, better. Uh, but as I've said already, uh, Finland and Sweden are in a very different place now than before they applied. <clears throat> it matters that uh, all allies have ex uh, signed the accession protocol. It matters that they are now participating in NATO's military and civilian structures. It matters that, uh, that several NATO allies have uh, issued uh, security assurances, and it matters that NATO has increased its presence uh, in, uh, in the region. Uh, so uh, uh, it is absolutely inconceivable that uh, uh, there will be any kind of aggression against Finland and Sweden without NATO acting. So, so it's not as nothing has happened, a lot has happened all, uh, already. Um, then we also have to remember that no other ally has suffered more terrorist attacks than Turkey, and they have the right for self-defense. Uh, and, 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 and they have some concerns, they've raised them, uh, and, uh, and now they are addressed by Finland and Sweden, and I welcome that very constructive uh, process. Um, then Hans from Sweden, yes, uh, you are right, uh, we are good neighbors, and for uh, roughly 100 years we had uh, the same king. Uh, the, the more surprising thing that the first common king we had was actually a French general, uh, uh, Jean-Baptiste Bernadotte, uh, who actually ended up as a Swedish king. And the last time Sweden was at war was against Norway. Uh, and since then, it has been very peaceful. And then you uh, join NATO. So this is a... A little more bitterness yeah, coming no, out No, no, it's not bitterness. The strange thing with the Nordic countries is that they have been fighting for centuries. And now they are best friends. And they can joke with it. That's a good thing. Uh, so, uh, but you're right. And, and you're right that, that, uh, that, um, that the Nordic countries are all very close neighbors. They work very closely together. And, and, and of course, it will... Uh, strengthen also the cooperation in the high north uh, when uh, uh, all the countries are part of the same security uh, alliance, uh, part of, uh, of, of NATO, uh, and, uh, and that, uh, that's, that's something that uh, yeah, will benefit the whole uh, uh, alliance. Uh, then uh, Nico Finland, you also spoke about the membership. Uh, yes, I it, it will. By being together in NATO, uh, we can work so uh, even more closer together. Uh, uh, and, 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 and I think it's important also to convey the message to the rest of the alliance that this is not only good for the Nordics, but it's good for the whole uh, alliance. Uh, it's obvious when it comes to the Baltics, uh, the, the eastern part of the alliance, because uh, we have then much better ways to reinforce that part of the alliance if needed. But it's also critical for the whole transatlantic uh, link. Because by increasing our uh, uh, strength in the high north, we also stre strengthen our capability to protect the vital uh, links of communications, the sea lines uh, uh, across the, the, the uh, North Atlantic. And that is exactly what is binding North America and Europe together, and which is the, uh, the fundamental link uh, within the NATO alliance. And I also know that Finland and Sweden, they are ready to participate in different NATO missions and operations. They have been in Afghanistan, they have been uh, in, 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 in Iraq, they have participated uh, also in many of the missions we uh, are conducting in the south. And uh, uh, Sweden just announced that they will uh, contribute more also to the NATO counter-terrorism fund. So, so actually I'm absolutely certain that this will benefit not only the north, but to the whole uh, of the alliance. 
Uh, then I think I've covered all uh, questions, and uh, and uh, and uh, it's all. Uh, and then let me just end by saying, for me, it is always a pleasure to meet you, and I really mean it, uh, because you are so important for the strength of this alliance. Without uh, parliaments uh, in our back, without uh, parliaments supporting us, uh, the efforts of NATO allies, there is no way that NATO can continue as the most successful alliance in history. So I thank you for your support, for your commitment, and what you do every day to ensure that NATO remains the most successful alliance in history. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. We promised to have you out of here at 12.50, and it's 12.47, so. Um, but uh, thank you for always being there for us, and thank you for your critical leadership at a very difficult moment here in Europe. Um, uh, we know we're in steady hands having Jens Stoltenberg as the Secretary General of our alliance. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General. So we are, let me just fill in, we, we have uh, some business left.